Hello, and welcome. I'm Daughter of Darkness, your narrator. When shopping for a new home, there are a lot of things to consider. Price, size, amenities, and of course, the all-important location, location, location. But some unfortunate people also have to consider the unseen entities that have taken up residence on the property. Those are the stories I'll be presenting here tonight. Be sure to join me here every Thursday at 5 p.m. Central for new content. And if you like tonight's video, go ahead and give it a thumbs up, share the link with someone, and comment below. It really helps to grow the channel so we can keep meeting like this every week. But for now, sit back, relax, let me lead the way, and let's get scared together, together. In 2017, my girlfriend and I moved into a tiny house in our college town. The house was made by a couple of students, so the architecture was a bit sloppy. For example, the roof was flat. Take note of this. It will be important to the story later. However, the house was really cheap and close to campus, so it seemed like a total steal. The first couple of months living there were nothing out of the ordinary but it wasn't too long before we started experiencing strange paranormal activity. The first such occurrences happened with our smoke detectors. They would go off constantly, even when there wasn't smoke in the house. We thought maybe it was because the batteries were old, but no matter how many times we changed them, it never made any difference. It got to the point where they were going off up to five times a day until we just finally broke down and took the batteries out of all of them. And there were six detectors in total. However, even without the batteries, the smoke detectors were still going off. So out of sheer desperation, we turned off the entire smoke detector circuit to the house. And it was at that point when things started to really get out of control. The storage room for our house always had a very eerie feeling to it, like someone was watching you or standing right behind you, staring you down. Thankfully, our bedroom was the farthest room in the house from that storage area, so I avoided it like the plague. One night, around 3 a.m., the smoke detector in our bedroom went off. However, it wasn't the usual repetitive beeping. It was one long, continuous beep. Now, keep in mind, this is without any batteries in any of the six detectors and having the electrical circuit shut off. My girlfriend grabbed a chair from the dining room and stood on it to reach the detector. But moments before she touched it, it stopped beeping. We both groaned with irritation and she went to put the chair back. But before she even made it back into the dining room, the smoke detector down the hall went off, making that same continuous beep. So, like before, she took the chair down the hall and stood on it to reach the detector. But again, right before touching it, the beeping stopped. This happened with all six detectors, continuing the pattern all the way back to that creepy storage room. This little dance happened two more times that night. It was as if whatever was messing with us was trying to lead us back into that room. And it happened at least once or twice a week for the duration of the 18 months that we lived in that house. Shortly after the encounters with the smoke detectors, the house became absolutely infested with bugs. There was no history of bug issues when we bought the house, and it started almost immediately after our first experience with the smoke detectors. Bugs would simply pour out of the light fixtures, tiny cracks in the walls, and of course, the smoke detectors. Literally, one minute everything would be fine, and the next, ants or other bugs would come out of the walls and the smoke detectors. We had multiple exterminators come, but less than a week after each treating of the house, the bugs would be back just as bad as before. It was unnatural. Here's a video my girlfriend made. 
so the smoke detector in the back room keeps going off. So I came over to check it. I'm going to vomit. Those are ants. Ah, that's gross. There's literally thousands of ants crawling out of that. Ugh. Both of us started getting really scared and depressed. We hated being home, but there was no other place for us to go. It was about this time we started hearing footsteps. Remember how I said the roof was flat? At least a few times a week, we would start hearing large, heavy, hoof-like footsteps on the roof. We told ourselves it was just an animal, so whenever we heard it, we'd step outside to see if we could spot the animal in question. But there was never anything there. And the steps were very far apart from one another, indicating a very large stride. Whatever was walking on our roof would start from that creepy storage room area, and in just three or four steps it would be on top of the roof above our bedroom. And the steps were loud, so loud that it sounded like it was either very heavy or stomping to get our attention. Then the phantom sounds began. We had large metal bowls that we used daily for cooking, and when we were done, we'd wash them and set them on the counter to dry. The kitchen was right next to the living room, but there was an island blocking our view of the sink area. Here's a picture. One night, we were startled by the sound of our heavy metal bowls being thrown off the counter. We assumed the worst and thought someone was breaking into the house. We both ran into the kitchen, but not only was no one in the house, nothing in the kitchen had been moved. The bowls were all still on the counter where we left them. This began happening at least five to ten times a day, at all hours. After a while, we got so sick of this that we just stopped using the metal bowls. Well, this annoyed the spirit. So next, we started hearing what sounded like our ceramic plates being smashed to the ground, and our kitchen cabinets would slam over and over again. But here's the thing. You know those type of cabinet hinges that close very slowly and quietly? Well, that's what we had. So to slam our kitchen cabinets like that, especially over and over again, they had to have been closed with an extreme force. And it would probably break them if that happened. But they never broke. The next phase of our haunting was sightings and photographs. The phone I had at the time had one of those automatic face tracking features, meaning that when you were taking a photo, on my phone a yellow box would appear around the person's face so you could focus on them. One night, I was taking a selfie in the bedroom when a yellow face tracking square appeared at the foot of our bed, way above the foot of our bed, as if a person standing seven feet tall were there. At the time, we did have posters on the bedroom wall so while focusing on the face tracking square, I circled the room to confirm that the tracker wasn't just focusing on one of those by accident. But to my dismay, no matter where I went in the room, or from what angle I held the phone, the square stayed in the exact same place, seven feet off the foot of the bed. After that, having my camera's yellow tracker box detect something seven feet tall in all of our pictures became a constant occurrence throughout the entire house. The final phase of our haunting were the physical attacks. Now, this happened more often to my girlfriend than me, but something would grab and pull our hair, especially when we were walking through the living room. But the most terrifying experience by far happened to our friend Jamie. She was aware of the paranormal happenings in the house and had seen a lot of them firsthand but nothing she knew compared to what was about to happen. She had come to visit for a few nights, and while she was there, she slept on the couch in the living room. Here's a photo of the infamous couch. It was around three in the morning, and she woke up with an uncomfortable feeling. All of a sudden, she felt someone or something step on to the couch and starting from her feet, it slowly walked up the length of her body 
until it felt like two feet were stood on either side of her head. She said she felt an intense, malicious energy staring down at her, but she was too terrified to open her eyes. Meanwhile, the cabinets in the kitchen began slamming over and over again. For the next couple of hours, she pretended to be asleep while this presence stood over her. She told me she's not exactly sure when it went away because she eventually became so exhausted from fear that she fell asleep. Not long after that experience, we were finally able to sell the house and get the heck out of there. We lost a lot of money because we sold the house for way less than we paid for it. I can't help but feel bad for the person who bought the house, but it's been almost three years and she's still living there. I think the takeaway from the story is, if the price of the house is too good to be true, then it is. This experience scared me so badly, it's taken me a couple of weeks to write it down. I feel physically ill just remembering it. My partner and I are trying to buy our first house, and we got pre-qualified. But there aren't a lot of houses out there that fit our budget and loan requirements. That means that we've been looking at a lot of weird old houses. And honestly, they've been horrible. We actually regret not buying the one that was sliding off its foundation because it turns out to be the best of the lot so far. One smelled so badly of sewage that the moment our realtor opened the door, he turned to us and said, Uh, we're done looking at this one, aren't we? Yes, we were. Another, advertised as a fixer-upper, turned out to be only half a house. The other half was lost in a landslide. Kudos to the photographer, though. You'd never know it from the listing. So we were a little cynical by the time our realtor called us and announced that he had found the perfect house for us. My partner viewed the listing online, though, and he said, I think this could be the one. We headed out to see it immediately. My partner's mom was with us at the time, so she came along. I actually get along with her very well and value her opinion, so I was happy that she was with us. When we got there, the house seemed too good to be true. It was an old farmhouse, but in great shape. No failing septic tanks and no porches being held up with truck jacks. Not even peeling paint or rusty hinges. It was incredibly roomy, with high ceilings, and it had some really nice details like chandeliers and a new stainless steel refrigerator. It even had several extra bedrooms. We couldn't believe that such a nice place was listed at such a low price. There must be something wrong with it, right? Well, right there, we should have recognized the plot to every haunted house story ever. We stepped through the door, and my partner and the realtor headed in one direction to go look at something or other, leaving his mother and I in the front room. She turned to me and said, Wow, what do you think? And all I could say was, I don't like it. Now, I do not know why I said that. She caught me off guard with the question, and I answered with the first thing that popped into my head. I keep going back over it trying to remember my reasoning for saying that I didn't like the house at that time, and I just don't have any reason. I think she tapped into my lizard brain. I must have felt something was wrong subconsciously before it registered in my consciousness. She looked at me kind of funny, because she knows I'm the type to really dig in and look around before making any decisions. She said, well, let's look around a little anyway. I nodded and we both headed off in different directions to check out the house. But things took a definite turn for the worse when I entered the kitchen. I kept hearing a beeping noise. At first I thought it was one of the appliances malfunctioning. Then the realtor entered the kitchen after me and I asked him, what's that noise? He just kind of looked at me confused and shook his head. 
I figured since he was kind of an older guy, maybe his hearing wasn't so good, and that's why he wasn't hearing the noise that I heard. But in less than a minute, the noise turned from an intermittent beeping to a constant ringing noise. It didn't even stop when I went outside of the house to walk around the property. In fact, it never changed no matter where I went. Normally a constant sound will either grow louder or softer as you move nearer or further away from the source. But this ringing was just everywhere. It was so pervasive that it didn't stop ringing until we were in the car and had driven a block away. In the car driving home, I told my partner and his mom about it, but neither of them had heard any noise at all. My partner said, I didn't hear any ringing, but oh, that smell. What smell, I said. Neither his mother nor I had smelled anything unusual, but he insisted that there was a really strong, sickly sweet smell throughout the house. Now, this was doubly weird because he has a very poor sense of smell. It's actually kind of a family joke. He smoked for years and it seems to have destroyed his sense of smell. So it just isn't possible for him to smell a really strong odor that the rest of us can't. As we continue to compare notes, I said another thing I found very odd was the fact that both of them started to argue with me in the kitchen about the placement of the microwave. It was one of those microwaves that's combined with a vent and positioned over the stovetop. It was unusually low though, and as I tried to reach the knobs on the stove, I found I couldn't do it without contorting weirdly. So I had just said, I wonder if we can move that. And they both jumped on me and started arguing. My partner said, hey, that's a feature that most people actually want because it's so convenient and we're lucky that it's already installed there. Why would you want to change it? And his mom agreed. She said, I love my microwave above the stove in my own kitchen. You'll love it too. You just have to get used to it. And my partner said, yeah, I really like that feature in my mom's house. Well, that's when I really knew that something was wrong with that house. It's totally out of character for my partner and his mom to argue with me over anything. I know it sounds strange, but in all our years together, we've never argued. We always talk things out calmly and come to a compromise based on a list of positives and negatives. His mom is the same way. That's because his former stepfather was a very abusive man, and he abused them both. And I'm a survivor myself, and now I'm a social worker. So arguing is completely against nature for all three of us. But in the kitchen, and again when I brought it up in the car, they both started arguing with me about that microwave like it was a recording on a loop. His mom said again, I love my microwave above the stove. And my partner kept agreeing with her. That's when I said, enough, Rita, in your kitchen, the microwave is next to the refrigerator, and your range is set in the middle of an island. There is no vent. Your microwave is nowhere near your stove. Dead silence. The kind of silence that comes when two people realize that an evil house just rewrote their memories and thoughts. It gets worse, though. Driving away from that house, reviewing what had just happened, my partner said, I kind of knew something was wrong by the look on your face in the kitchen. I've never seen that look on your face before. And you just walked out of the house and sat in the yard waiting for us to finish up inside. So I told the realtor, we're done here. We don't want the house. I felt kind of bad. It's such a nice house. And he must think we're crazy. But I thought... If one of us doesn't like it, then it's not the house for us. And besides, that smell. I don't think I could have lasted there very long if we couldn't get rid of that smell. I told him that I still didn't smell anything. But I really tried to like the house. I really tried to keep looking to see if maybe I could just sort of get used to the ringing and everything. But then, at this point, 
I started crying, remembering what happened. My partner said, Honey, what's wrong? What happened? Why did you go outside? You never even went upstairs. Because of the kitchen, I said. Because of the kitchen. It was hard to get the words out, but I continued. You know how when we look at houses, I like to run water, then feel the pipes under the sink for leaks? Well, when you guys left the kitchen, I stayed behind to do that. But there was a bunch of junk under the sink. Old paper bags, bottles and stuff. And then that stupid garbage disposal got in the way. So the water pipes ran off to the side, deep into the cabinet. And it was really dark in there and I couldn't see. So I had to just sort of reach my arm back and feel my way through all the stuff and junk. And then I felt something grab my wrist. I was trying to make sense of it. I thought maybe I'd caught my watch band on something or that I had somehow gotten my arm tangled up in that mess of pipes. My brain just couldn't make any sense of it. So I was holding very still. I didn't want to jerk my arm out fast and break my watch or bang up my arm. So I was holding really still, thinking about how to navigate out of there. And that is when I clearly felt the sensation of whatever had grabbed my wrist slowly let go. The fingers of the hand, if that's what it was, felt dry and leathery. And as it loosened its grip on my wrist, it slid upwards, then back. And that's how I knew it wasn't some bag handle or something that I'd snagged on falling off. Because I was holding perfectly still, and it slid off of me upwards. So, yeah. I nearly died of a heart attack alone right there on the kitchen floor of a haunted house. I got up, left that cabinet door open and noped it right out of that house and went to the yard to wait for my partner, his mother, and the realtor. We are not going back to that house, even to drive past the place again. I feel bad for whoever buys it, but listen kids, if it's too good to be true, it means just that, too good to be true. Now, I can take flitting shadows and lights turning off and on on their own here and there, things like that. But I draw the line when something grabs me in the dark. No, just no. On a side note, I told my coworker about it the next day. She told me it reminded her of the time she was younger and had gone on a date. They went to the theater to see the Amityville Horror movie. And at the point in the movie where the demonic voice says, Get out. Her date turned to her and said, Yeah, now there's the difference between you white folks and the rest of us. When a house tells us to leave, we leave. So, seriously, what's with the beeping sound from all these evil entities? Is this a thing now? Are they trying to drive people out of their minds? Is that it? I swear, some of these spirits are such tools, aren't they? If you like this video and you haven't yet, subscribe and hit that notification bell. It takes a village to combat these evil spirits, so join us here every week and help us in doing so. It's just not the same without you here with us. As always, I'd like to thank all of you for listening tonight and for your continued support. I truly appreciate each and every one of you. So, until next time, stay scared, my friends. <laughs>